Hello, bastards and bastardettes. How we doing? All right, kind of getting settled in here for the uh, the uh, thingy today. The fucking thingy. So, um, as you saw, I think we're gonna have CSI Humboldt come stop by. Uh, whenever I, I, he may not show up at the very beginning, but he'll be here at some point, and we will go over what he saw in the NL reproduction. And let me get not so in here. Or do I have to do them both same time? I can't remember. Let's see. So we'll keep our eyes peeled for when CSI pops up. You guys let me know. Wasabi. I need to teach you how to use a camera. What the fuck do you mean teach as me how a, to use a camera? Uh, as my own head's cut off. Yeah, this is... <laughs> This is a professional. There's head, something called headspace that you need to get. There you go. This is a professional. I'm just analyzing my shit. You're just super anal. Dude, I, <laughs> I like logged in and like your shit was like aiming at the wall. I know. I, I started, I start off with a scenery of my, of my ceiling. You do. Yeah. Cause nobody wants to see my fucking face the first time they jump in. I don't want to traumatize anyone. I, I want to be, <laughs> I want it to be smooth. Definitely not. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So, um, I'm trying to think of how to start this. Uh, well, I don't know what you said because I just popped up. I haven't on, said anything. We're hoping, uh, managing technical difficulties and whatnot, that we might be able to get a CSI on to chat about some stuff. Yeah. Um, and, uh, this, uh, this Friday evening, we kind of decided that we were going to maybe sort of merge uh, something that's current uh, going on right now with some historical shit. Yeah. Right. And we had an excellent opportunity to do that in the uh, in the NL5 project yes. that Matt and and CSI have been up to. Uh, and NL5 probably needs uh, no introduction in the sense that it's probably like one of the most famous terms in all of cannabis. Yep. Uh, but there's a lot of legend behind it, and there's a lot of misinformation behind it. And so we thought for this episode, maybe we could sort of like take you guys through like how it started, some of the history to it. And a lot of this stuff has been chatted about in various ways and shapes and forms. But we thought it might be interesting to sort of like coalesce it all into one show. Yeah. Uh, and start from back then and sort of bring it into the now bring it uh, into because, the modern times yeah. yeah because you know so i mean i've done i've helped with some like 90s stuff and uh it makes me feel old but you know the 90s is like 30 plus years ago now uh and the 80s when all this shit was happening was 40 plus years ago now so yeah. most people in cannabis have heard about nl5 but it's mostly just legends and there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of funny cuts and a lot of odd stories and so we kind of thought we'd just chat about those kind of aspects a little bit and sort of merge the history with uh, a little bit of the project that these guys are doing um, because they tie in together. They so do. That's and kind of... Yeah. I mean, where do we want to start? Uh, you know, we can start with, um, maybe I'll start, maybe we can start with just the generalization, you know, and then yeah, we'll start, start with there. some history. So. The reason why everybody knows what NL5 is, in my opinion, is because of Neville, right? Yeah. Uh, Neville uh, popularized it. He picked a selection uh, and he used the NL5 in a bunch of famous crosses, one of which was probably the most famous line of all time, the NL5 haze. Yes. Uh, and then other groups and Canadian seed banks and all these different things started using the name NL5, NL5, right? Yeah. And it just sort of became part of the fabric of cannabis history, yeah, if you will, right? That's and there fair. was a lot misunderstood about it or whatever, but it's probably one of the most recognizable terms in cannabis. Yeah, I think even people like my parents, uh, my mom, my dad was who he was with weed, but my mom had nothing to do with it. She wanted nothing to do with it, never learned it. And even she has sort of Northern Lights as a straight. Yeah. And yeah. Northern Lights and Northern Lights 5 and all that. And so now what we've got going on is, is I've joked on previous episodes or whatever that like when I was trying to collect 
uh, a lot of old stuff, it was almost impossible. Um, but now we're kind of in this wave of, you know, famous things from the 80s and 90s, you know, or in any form they might exist in has, has, has got a resurgence yeah. of popularity and interest. And people want to see what's up with, you know, what was once common becomes legendary. Yeah. Right? Is, really, is kind of what it boils down to. And so for anyone that came into the weed scene later when NL5 was already kind of a myth, um, you, know, uh, you know, hopefully we can like clear up a bunch of stuff because there's a lot of, there's a lot of people that are talking about the name. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So uh, when we tell this tale, let's go ahead and start with, there was a man named Herbie. Sure. And Herbie uh, went to a certain hair, hair salon where the Northern Light crew hung out. And he would go to, they would go to this hair salon and commune and smoke weed and talk stuff. Well, this guy named Herbie came in and he was a, a veteran and he um, wanted to be able to grow and make a living for himself. So they set him up with some lights and some some of the original Steve Murphy Afghani seeds, and he had some of his own um, different hybrids he was working with, mostly Colombian and Mexican, I believe that was the uh, quote. Um, yeah, and and he he was the one who selected this NL5 clone from or from his own work with the Steve Murphy Afghan and the Hawaiian. So yeah, I mean, probably the the way that people can understand it the best is that there was a loose collective group of friends, you know, you know, acquaintances, whatever, in the Pacific Northwest area. Yeah, um, Herbie was one. There was a guy named some some people call him the Indian. Uh, mm -hmm. Was another one. Um, Steve Murphy was a different one. Um, there was, uh, you know, a um, there was a number of different characters all involved at yes. various points and so it was a mostly everyone has to remember that in that time in the early 80s almost everything in america was still sativa and blends of different sativas because all the all the weed that came into america was seeded sativa weed right yeah. so the core of everybody starting to breed was you got free seeds with your sativa weed lots and of them lots <laughs> of them and the rare shit was indica because yeah. indica made hash hash didn't come with free seeds and so indica seeds were really hard to acquire uh they came from people on the hippie hashish trail people like sam Skunkman and neville and others made trips to afghanistan which in that era was extremely difficult to do and um, dangerous it's still. dangerous and yeah. they started bringing back small amounts of seeds so yeah. unlike sativa that was getting sativa seeds spread out all over America in every kilo that was sold, indica seeds were hard to come by. Yeah. So the NL story starts with a very small handful of seeds of pure indica that came from this dude named Steve Murphy. Yeah. Right? And then, of course, just like anybody, um, the group in, in the Pacific Northwest up there started making hybrids of this stuff. They crossed it to itself. They crossed it to everything else they had. And the the famous numbers of NL basically, you know, connotate like the lower the number, the more indica and the shorter it was. Yeah. So the one, two, three, four were, were pre, pre, you know, predominantly indica based and smaller. And you start getting into five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and they start getting more and more sativa. Now Matt's already interviewed one of the main characters uh, in the fr in in this thing, and he basically stated that they took that Steve Murphy Afghan and they crossed it to every sativa they could get their hands on. So Hawaiians, Mexicans, Colombians, Thai, Indians. He said Indians. Indians. Yeah. Uh, blends of those things, hybrids of those things, all back and forth. Right. Yeah. So the NL five, they had this buddy named Herbie who got involved and uh, Herbie had a Hawaiian. Okay. And this Hawaiian was, um, you know, he crossed, he, it got crossed to the Steve Murphy Afghan and the, it got called NL five. 
uh, for its position and the height and the blend of sativa versus indica or whatever. And they found a pheno that they really, really liked. So yeah. NL5 initially was a seed line created within that little crew. And then Herbie gave back to the NL crew like this select pheno that he was super excited about. And so the, as best we can tell, it's a pure Afghan from Steve Murphy on the one side and a Mexican Colombian, we believe, on the other side. That was called a Hawaiian because it was it, called a Hawaiian because it was grown in Hawaii, but there is yeah. no indigenous Hawaiian weed. Yeah. Most Hawaiian weed was Mexican, Colombian, a blend of those two or a blend of those two with Afghan. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, and then as you know, as the story's been told, uh, this gentleman um, sent Neville uh, a, uh, a whole bunch of seeds, all numbered, right? Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you have any of those catalogs handy, but Neville's I story don't. is that, Neville's story is that he was, um, you know, he did a lot of work with them and a lot of them, as we found out, were a mess because they were a blend of indicas and, and sativas. Yeah. But in this one seed of NL5, out of a bunch of indica, sativa, hybrids, and a mess, he found this plant that was what he called a pure indica throwback that showed zero sativa influence. Yeah. It was short. It was squat. It was leafy. It was covered in frost. It didn't have a lot of smell. Um, and so he started crossing this to things, and it crossed amazingly well with basically everything he threw on it. Yeah. So the legend of NL5 was born because he crossed it to Skunk One and he crossed it to NL, he crossed it to Hayes and he crossed it to NL2 and he crossed it to a few other things. Uh, it started showing up in poly hybrids he made like Silver Pearl. Yeah. And it just sort of became one of the building blocks of his gen a genetic library. And since he was one of the first dudes that had a seed bank, anything that he had that he threw into a bunch of crosses kind of went everywhere. Yeah. Right. And all these things are winning high times, you know, stuff. And it's getting big glossy pictures. And NL5 Haze was the most popular strain they sold. So the legend of it just took off. Now, there's a debate here because what, what's indisputable is that he went to the States and he got uh, the Pacific Northwest hash plant and the, um, and the G13 through friends of uh, another guy who's pretty famous named Jorge Cervantes. Some friends of his hooked him up and he arranged for the cutting that the guys in the Pacific Northwest were growing as NL5 to be shipped over, right? Yeah. And so they did this, they did this clever thing where they shipped this plant over in a terrarium of other plants and they took scissors and they cut the serrations off the edges of each of the pot leaves. <laughs> so it didn't look like wheat. That's sick, huh? That's right? like a they sick just, they idea. Just shaved, they just <laughs> shaved all that off. So it looked unusual. And if you, Neville is posted uh, back when he used to post on Mr. Nice, that he didn't like that one as much because it wasn't as consistent of a breeder as the one he found amongst the seed line. Yeah. And so he didn't use it. Yeah. So right there, you have this massive confusion where everybody thinks NL5 is the same thing. Where it is kind of the same thing, but there's a seed line that never got out. There's a clone that they selected from that seed line that was popular in Washington. Yeah. And there's a clone that, that Neville found among seeds they sent to him and they all got called NL5. Yes. And so, that's where a lot of the, con the confusion lies. Yeah. So people think they'll be like, oh, I've got the same clone that Neville used in all of his breeding, but it never left the West Coast. Yeah. Well, no, because Neville says he found it in seed. Yeah. You know, so there was there was two select cuttings even early. Um, and, you know, most people don't realize this, but Neville says his was like a total Afghan throwback. And the one that, that uh, the Seattle crew describes had like two foot colas on it, right? Yeah, that's Big, right. Big, long, running, lime green colas. Well, yes and no. 
Yes um, and no. If I remember, if I remember, it was stated that they combined different buds to make it look like it had a massive cola for Neville in the picture. Oh Jesus! Yeah, so that there was some <laughs> fun stuff going on. There was some shenanigans, perhaps. Yes, shenanigans abound. There was some shenanigans. So there's a so yeah, I mean, there's an aspect where. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking down for a second because Matt didn't have his catalog handy. I know, but, I always do too. But I do. I don't know if there's a bigger version of this, Let's but see. if everyone wants to look, oh, that yeah, picture yeah. right there, that is a picture of the mother cut taken in Amsterdam and put in the Sensi Seeds catalog, taken when it won a cup in 1995. It was printed in the 96 catalog. That is, a, that is one of the few existing pictures of an actual growing NL5 that Neville used. And yeah. you can see it's short, it's squat, it's leafy as fuck, you know? Mm -hmm. It's got all these things going on to it. Um, and so, you know, uh, so NL5, Neville said that NL5 was prob NL5 Hayes was probably the most famous and best selling thing in his whole catalog, both at his seed bank and later at Sensi. Yeah. Um, the NL5 Skunk 1 got renamed. It's, I don't know if it was renamed Shiva, Shiva Skunk. Yeah. I think it was renamed Shiva Skunk at, at Sensi Seeds, but it was sold the whole time. Yeah. Um, so probably it was sold from 87 or 88 all the way through, uh, you know, 1999 or the early 2000s. Still probably to this day, but it's not the same shit. Yeah. Um, and NL5 Haze was sold consistently. So... You know, it just kind of entered into the lexicon. Everybody knows NL5 Hayes. Yeah. And it's gotten old enough now that a bunch of people are like, oh, I have it. I have the original cutting. I have the this. I have the that. So, you know, um, you know, and, uh, and, and, you know, it, it, um, someone's saying nothing about the NL crew telling Neville that, I mean, Neville, you know, Neville spoke about the NL, but he basically like, has said that he just got um he just got these labeled seeds and he made his own inferences about them you know so yeah you know he had to, he had to make it up basically like he had to think what what am i seeing yeah um and then you know the guys back then they, it was in the 80s and they were all scared of getting busted so they didn't really take copious notes no and that either. Yeah. that was stated um, several times you know, and we actually know a bit more about the NL5 than we know about a lot of the other NL numbers because of what Herbie was working with and what he said he crossed to the Steve Murphy to get that NL5. Yeah. So it's like a lot of things, you know, I mean, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of breedings are collaborative. It's a small group of friends doing one part at my garage and you do the next part at yours and this and that and everything else and who's responsible for it. There might be one or two people that gets known for it, but in reality, there's a whole little group that's involved. Yeah, it was it was a, a kind of small group. Yeah, right. Yep. So, you know, uh, and then you know, when it comes to NL5 Hayes, uh, Neville claims that right before he left Sensi, about '95 ish, uh, they lost the mother of NL5. Dope. It died. And it makes kind of sense because if you like, there's a bunch of NL5 Hayes cuts that still are kept in in America, especially in the New York region and in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. and they all are basically from '88 to '95. Yeah, you know, there's not really people aren't really like, oh, I got this one in 2002, uh, but there was a lot of fire in those seven or eight years that they were able to marry those two plants together. Yeah, you know, and then. You know, uh, Super Silver Haze and stuff like that was kind of Neville's attempt to blend the three most famous Amsterdam lines together, uh, mm -hmm. which was NL, Skunk, and Haze. And so, you know, now we have this whole thing where everything gets different names and different nicknames, and tons of shit has NL or Skunk or Haze blended into it. Yeah. But you might not know because it doesn't have that name attached. You know, uh, no, someone said, I assumed it was phenos of one to nine. No, it was different hybrids. So NL1 was almost pure Afghan. NL2 
was another Afghan that they actually got like a Kush type Afghan from the Indian. And they blended that to Steve Murphy. Yeah. Three and four are sort of lost to time. Nobody has them, but they were also, you know, they started increasing amounts of sativa and five through 11 were just the NL crews crossing that Afghan to different sativas. Yeah. And, you know, the more, the higher the number, the taller the plant, the more sativa influenced. Yeah. Right? Yep. That's so, how we know it. So if you look around uh, at some of Neville's early catalogs, you can see him playing around. He uses the eight. He uses the five. He uses the nine. He's got the one and the two, you know, all these different things. And then after three or four years, he decided basically that he was only going to breed with the one, the two, and the one cutting of the five that he found. Yeah. And so all these other hybrids kind of go away. Because probably because they were mixes of extreme sativas with indicas, and they were probably a lot more of a pain in the ass for a breeder to tame. Yeah. And and he did have high, high as far as his keepers, he did use a, uh, a rigorous selection. So he didn't keep, he went through a lot of seeds to yeah, find what he kept. And the Indian, I believe the Indian was Native American, but I can't say that for certain. Yeah, he, but he, he was... was he was Native American. But he was he was part of the Pacific Northwest crew. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of these guys aren't aren't well known and don't want to be well known because in the 80s, especially in the late 80s, there was a series of rolling busts and they all got in trouble. Yeah. Uh, so it was a hard time to be a cultivator. You know, um, getting a green merchant. Yeah. Yeah. And all, and all that. It was there was a lot of persecution back then. There was a lot of secrecy back then. That's part of why they didn't keep copious notes because they didn't want them to be used against them in a court of law later on. Um, and so, you know, but basically, I, say, I think it's fair to say that the reason why everybody knows NL5 is because of Neville. That, I think that's fair. I think everybody agrees with that too. Because he, and even like the Seattle guys will say that if they hadn't sent it to Neville, mm -hmm. it likely would have been lost. Yeah because they went through a rolling series of busts and had issues. Yeah. You know, so it, so it was sold at Neville's seed bank for a number of years. And then it was sold at Sensi for a number of years after that. Mm -hmm. uh, never pure. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, always a hybrid skunk yeah. one, Hayes, NL2, silver pearl, other poly hybrids blended together, but never really by itself. Yeah. So there was a pure seed line of NL5, but nobody got it. It wasn't sold. It didn't make it to out of Amsterdam. It was given to like a couple people. And even like, even great, you know, uh, even like some of the Seattle guys said that there was a couple of cuts that got out the eight, the nine, and maybe one of the, and maybe one of the twos from the Indian, but nothing else. Yeah. So the five survived because it went to Amsterdam, basically. Yeah, that, it's, that's the only reason it survived. That's the only reason why it survived. So if you listen to the Seattle crew, they had one version of NL5 that they kept as a cutting and, and kind of cropped out. Uh, Neville found a breeder that he kept, you know? Yeah. And, you know, it kind of, it kind of went into, it kind of went into legend, um, you know? And so... You know, uh, and so, yeah, I, I see all kinds of people. What's up with this person's NL1? What's up with this NL5? What happened is, is because it became so famous, okay, two things happened. One is that in Amsterdam, anytime anything gets famous, people get seeds of it and they white label it. Yeah. Right? And they offer up their own versions of it, okay? And then on top of that, when the Canadian seed companies got involved... They ended up buying a bunch of stuff from Amsterdam, blending it to Canadian strains and claiming that they had these things for sales purposes. Yeah. You know, so you get and, and they all have sort of dodgy history. Yeah. When it comes to provenance, what I've what I've told you so far is pretty much factually agreed to by the people that sent it to Neville and Neville. Yeah. And people around Neville. Yeah. You know, and then yeah. it gets famous. And there's a proliferation of people and seed banks that claim to have various stuff. But they weren't passing out this cutting to other people. No. They weren't sharing it just so other people in different continents could like 
make their own seeds with it. It wasn't like today where people were trading seeds back and forth, no. you know, and, yeah. and clones back and forth, especially to competitors. You know, yeah. the Dutch are extremely business oriented. Very. They're not going to just like bro out. And yeah. Give no. you... <laughs> and yeah, that's why Matt's laughing because they very <laughs> are very much business oriented. If they have a cut and everyone else wants it and they're breeding off it and making money, there's not really a chance they're going to share that fucking thing. And there's a definite chance everybody's going to say that they have it. <laughs> yeah, there's a definite chance that everyone's yeah. going to say they have it and they're going to use that na Any name that becomes famous in yeah. cannabis gets used. Yeah. You know, so someone asked about, you know, and so um, that's kind of like, that's kind of where NL5, you know, just got crossed to some very famous things and Neville made some very fucking famous lines off it and there wasn't that much weed strains back then and the combination of that and high times being like the premier magazine in the 90s and you get all these high quality glossy photos and all the the cannabis cups and there was only one cannabis cup a year yeah so this shit got hella famous legendary you know yeah and um you know, know one and what about NL1? What's that? What about NL1? Oh, Denali's question. Oh, I, I didn't see it. I mean, NL1 is, is probably the closest thing to Steve Murphy Afghan. Um, it's, it's, it's got a little bit of discrepancy between the guys involved as to what exactly is in it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's, that's kind of irrelevant because what actually got sold is what got sent to Neville. And everybody should know that Neville got it in in uh in 84 85 mm -hmm. and spent two or three years seeing what he had so if you bought northern lights in 85 or 86 or even 87 from his catalog it was a fucking hodgepodge of any of the lines all blended together yeah it wasn't until about 88 that uh um it wasn't about i'm gonna turn off my light because people are bitching it wasn't about till 88 <laughs> that uh he started coming out with NL1, NL2, and NL5. Yeah. Right? And, uh, you know, and so, and then, so those, then these numbers get attached. I think 1989, late 88 is when NL5 Hayes got released. Yeah. And NL5 Skunk 1, and NL5 this. And so NL1, NL2, you know, when it went to Sensi, um, you know, they just called NL1 Northern Lights. Yeah. And they called NL2 Hindu Kush. Uh, and so lots of people got NL because it was one of the most common things sold. Yeah. Sorry, I had to screenshot something that's funny. No. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. I mean, people ask questions. Sometimes I'll yeah. get it, sometimes not. It's really hard to, like, pat your head and rub your stomach at the same time. So, like, I try to chat about something and sound like, you know, fairly have a, have some flow. And then I read a question and I think about it and all of a sudden I'm not talking and I'm just staring at the screen. So forgive me uh, for all that, yeah. you know, if I it's miss a your little question, ADHD. <laughs> yeah. If I miss your question, I'm, I'm sorry. It, it's just the way it works. So, you know, I've chatted about this a bunch before on some of the previous podcasts and a little bit more detail, but mm -hmm. that's what got it famous. That, that, that is the story. That is, that, that, is, that, that, is, that is the story. And so now anytime anything becomes famous, you know, it's kind of like music or fashion or something like that. It gets fucking recycled, right? Like but it gets old, old becomes enough new. and most people don't know about it. And then all of a sudden people are like, I've got this ancient NL5 cut and I'm making beans with it. Yeah. I've got this, 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 you know, um, you know, and maybe, maybe Matt, you could explain the boof cut or the, the new uh, cut. I, the I, new... I don't know. I, I've never talked to Bodhi about that one. And I keep meaning to ask him because people ask it a lot. But I don't know the the history on that one. So I mean, people, you know, and, you know, people asked about Bob Hemp Hill and, you know, uh, and, and, the, and Ella and stuff like that. And so people have been people, you know, it's really hard when you get seed when you get seeds and lines that are that are 25, 30 years old, plus uh provenance on it becomes difficult yeah. right you know 
Um, apparently, you know, uh, Hemp Hill used to work in, with uh, the Coastal Seeds Collective. Uh, and apparently, you know, he got it through some friend of Kagyu's. You know, um, but NL1 was sold for, you know, what, probably 20 years? Yeah, for a long time. For a long time. It was, it was sold. It was, and there was never a specific cut. I mean, Neville had some breeding males that he used. Uh, NL1 and NL2 and Neville's thing was almost always males. Yeah. They were part of his breeding males. And so it wasn't like NL5 while, while never, Neville just had one cutting that had to be kept alive. Yeah. NL1 was kind of like a line. Yeah. And so any, like Durbin poison or something, right? Yeah. So anytime there's a line, it's a lot harder to lose the line than it is when you're dependent on one specific cut to stay alive and keep going. Yeah. It's, and the other thing much people should know <laughs> is because these, these, these fucking Dutch guys are such businessmen, when you're not sharing a cut amongst your homies and your good friends, it exponentially increases the chance that some kind of disease or accident or drought or worker error is gonna kill your fucking cut. That greed will get you. And then you haven't shared it, so it gets lost. Right? Yep. Uh, and, you know, and so uh, Ben and Alan Dronkers aren't generous people. No, they weren't, they they weren't sharing. That. They weren't sharing shit with anybody. You know? Um, and, uh, you know, so I don't know. I mean, it, it, uh, NL5 is super famous. NL is super famous. They, we went through probably a 10 year period where nobody gave a shit. Uh, probably starting right around the Kush Sour going into Cookie era. Yeah. Uh, where old things were just old and unpopular. Right? Yeah. It's just, yeah, things like Northern Lights, Skunk One, these were a cheese. Things that, that like, people are kind of looking at now, like, oh, they got the fucking cheese. They got the, they got, like, if I saw that in a, in a store with tons of cl uh, clones in, you know, the early, mid-2000s, it's like, Huh? I ain't even, give me some of that new shit. Nobody was worried about that because it was so abundant. Oh, you know? dude. I mean, we, we had a, I can't remember who said it, but it's absolutely true. You know, 15, 20 years ago, you, you bought seeds from Nirvana, Gypsy Nirvana, and you got free Skunk One seeds because he might as well because you had so many of them and it was so common. It was, you know, you had to give them away. Yeah. Because nobody wanted to buy them. Yeah, it was super and, abundant. And so there's a thing where everything's so common, why would anyone want it? And people's tastes and change, you know, people's, you know, taste changes. And then it becomes rare. And then people want it again. Yeah. But most people in cannabis don't hold on to anything unless it's currently profitable. So what, what once becomes, we've, we've seen it over and over and over and over again, um, you know, where something that was once abundant yeah. becomes uber rare or lost to time. Like, I'll say it straight up. If it, you know, hopefully he pops on here this evening, but if it wasn't for CSI loving the Urkel and breeding with it a ton, most people wouldn't have access to it. Yeah. His prolific breeding is probably the reason why that genetic survived. Yeah. And I'm not saying he's the only person that held it. No, but it, but yeah. it got down. I used to know, I mean, we're not going to talk about purples very long here tonight, but like I used to know dozens upon dozens of growers 15 years ago that ran Urkel and you, and then diesel and Kush gets popular and like six people held on to it. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. It's yeah. That's how it goes, dude. And it's not. And, and the reason why I brought that up is because that's how, Super skunk became almost extinct. That's how nobody can find the the de the dead skunk terps. That's how all these things become rare or hoarded or extinct. Is they're so common nobody thinks they need to care to preserve it. And then hippies and growers start looking around at who's got that old school, and they can't fucking find it. And a lot of times the name game happens. It'll get a different name, or you know someone makes seeds with it and, and it has a different name that it carries on with so people don't even know to look in that direction for said one of these baselines yeah we've talked about that before too where i love the counterculture aspect of americans giving weed nicknames yeah but for lineage it's a real pain in the ass oh it's terrible because we take whatever the name of the actual thing is and it gets a nickname 
and then it goes to a different crew and they give it a different fucking nickname. Yeah. And then it goes to this other crew and they give it a spin on that name. Yeah. And then 20 years goes by and you're trying to trace what the hell it is. Yeah, playing telephone. And you gotta go through four or five nicknames back and then you get to the core thing and then you and then the trail goes dry. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. I mean, uh, so now after 10 or 15 years of nobody giving a shit about Northern Lights, it's hot. Yeah. People yeah. wanna try these ancient things that they grew up when they were kids reading about. Or these, the, the first wheat, the first like true famous wheat. Yeah. You know, they wanna see what's up. They wanna see what's up with it. And, uh, you know, and so now because there's interest, now all of a sudden where there's interest, there's economy and people start popping up with it. Yeah all over the place. And most people probably don't know that there was two completely distinct cuts that were used, one from America and one from Holland. Yeah. And there was a seed line, but it was given out to nobody. And then you see stuff where I've got NL5 pure. Well, how? Oh, yeah. yeah, lots of that. Right, how? Yeah. You know, you know, I mean, you can, you can talk, you can, you can know that, that Neville had it pure because the guy mm -hmm. that made it says, I sent it to him pure along with the rest of it. Yeah. And Neville says, I got it pure from dude. Okay, they both agree. Here's when I sent it, it exists. But did yeah. you share it with anybody? No. So everybody has a bunch of hybrids or Canadians got it and sold their shit and then people get it and it's got a name attached and they're like, you know, um, th there it is. Yeah. You know, and because we're cannabis and because all of our stories are kind of black market or underground or prohibition, -y, it gets really difficult to, to, sometimes it comes down to who you choose to believe. Yeah, and that, that's a lot of the time with a lot of these strains. And so some people will get like NL and, they'll, and the guy will be like, I've had this for 30 years, it never left the West Coast, it's, it's this. Yeah. And they're like, great, it's this. That's all the proof I need. Mm -hmm. Let's start breeding with it and it's this. And now it's labels all over the place and people are buying it. And is it that? One thing, one thing I also noticed was that during the Phylos era, um, a lot of people would get said clone that they got with dubious heritage or whatever. They submit it to Phylos. And f by doing so, say that Phy Phylos verified their clone as legitimate. You know? Oh God! Yeah, yeah. That happened. That started happening a lot too, and that was a real problem because, and as we learned, um, allegedly, shit. yeah, Phylos couldn't tell people any kind of plant relation with any consistency. And, I mean, the uh, thing that maybe we should say this about CSI is that it doesn't matter what it is, but CSI sent in. This is how. Matt, myself, and CSI discovered that Phylos was really, really, really full of it. Um, we had some evidence before, but this was kind of one of the big kickers, was that uh, CSI had made a cross, uh, and he sent in both parents. And I don't know if he wants this story out so much. No? Yeah. No. I'll, sh I'll shut up about it then. I didn't even <laughs> mention what it was. But I'll just say this. We, we discovered that their genetic sequencing wasn't as strong as we would have hoped. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was definitely disappointing with the consistency of it. You know, and so people thought that their genetic testing was like American genetic testing. Yeah, where you can have 23 and me or some shit and be like, Oh, my God, I'm 5% Norwegian. And you know, grandpa was from Germany and this guy and I'm like, and I'm part African or whatever. Yeah. And we were hoping that same kind of accuracy would be transferred into wheat. Yeah. And Hold on. I'm huh? trying to move Caleb in. Oh, we'll see. Caleb, click the thing and say request to join if you can. If you if you see how to do that. Hit the request to join button so I can uh, add you in. When you got time. All right, go ahead. Yeah, so I mean it it um and you know, in order the other the other thing about it is is for like talking about human genetics is geneticists can go to like a pure Norwegian or a pure Japanese or a pure Chinese or whatever, and they can start comparing DNA. Yeah. And seeing these different things and they know how to sequence it. If it would be amazing if DNA evidence had existed in Holland in the eighties yeah. and Neville and 
and SSSC and, and Sensi and these early groups would have been able to like put down markers of what was what. Yeah. And then we could have seen their descendants because you'd have something to compare it to. Yeah. But that's not always the case. That's not always the case. So, Unfortunately. you know, uh, so it, it remains a dream because here he is. Oh, hey. oh there he is. Sir, your lighting is terrible, but if you just, <laughs> you look like, you look like you're on 60 minutes and you're one of those like grayed out, you know, like guys under the witness protection program. It's too bright in here. It's too bright in here. Yeah. Well, we can hear I your can voice fine. Your face. Too bright. Yeah. Yeah. I ain't trying to, you know. <laughs> you know right well, you look beautiful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So maybe I talk a lot. So maybe I'll do like an introduction. Uh, not that one's needed and then I'll shut up and get out of the way. So yeah. part of the reason why we did, th we, tr we decided to do this selection tonight was because it blends uh, something that's currently going on with something that's extremely famous and uh, has a bunch of history to it. So I just right. spent a whole bunch of time chatting about the history of it and the simple and maybe like, you know, mellow way to talk about it is that uh, in, in our search of history, we started getting in contact with some of these uh, original Northern Lights crew people and hearing their story. And yeah. as part of that, uh, we got we got some seats. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt got some seats. And yeah. then uh, Matt uh, and and Caleb here uh, decided to collaborate on it. Uh, and and Caleb donated some space and some time and some energy and they uh, did a bunch of stuff, uh, both growing out phenos, looking within the line, making hybrids and all that. And so uh, I was I was involved as much as listening to them talk about it. So I'll <laughs> shut up and turn it over to them because uh, they are about to offer up some seeds of what they have going on. Uh, and it might be, you know, some of the first real NL to come on the market in a while. Um, so Matt and Caleb, why don't you chat about what you found and what you saw and what interested you and da, 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 da. Well, first things first, you know, I'm, you know, when I posted up on IG, you know, there's, there's a few people who were like, you know, what did, what did Matt have to do with any of this, you know, <laughs> and Fair I, question. Wouldn't, I wouldn't even be growing these seeds if Matt hadn't, uh, you know, had all that dialogue with, you know, mystery man <laughs> 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 and, you know. He, he's the one who, you know, put all that together. He's the one who sourced these seeds, essentially. So I wouldn't be growing nothing without Matt, you know, making that first step. So, yeah. No. And maybe, maybe I'll throw in one more thing so everyone knows. When, mm -hmm. you know, breeders like us get together, it's super common for mm -hmm. some breeding to be a collaborative process. Right, right. This guy's got some seeds. You know, they both have an idea. This other person has some room that they're willing to put towards the idea or a greenhouse or some indoor space. They come up with a plan and you breed together. Right. And people might <laughs> so not just hear about the JJ it. JJ of the transaction. <laughs> but but every but everybody, everybody, you know, lots, lots of friends who are breeders kind of collaborate on little things like that all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's super common, just so people just so people know. So, you know, um, you know, Matt had the seeds, uh, you know, CSI had the space. They and both, skill. <laughs> you know, and skill and, you know, and, and ability. Uh, we all had the interest in the history behind it mm -hmm. and really wanted to see what was in there. And so it, you know, the project happened. Right. And, uh, you know, some people know, some people don't. The, the very first, you know, clone I ever grew came from my dad. And that was Northern Lights back in 1994, you know. So Tell us about that one, dude. I mean, you what know, you I can remember. I mean, I rocked it on and off until about 2002 when I lost it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a cola plant, super frosty, a decent density, you know, not not like rock hard Girl Scout cookies or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I describe the nose, but I'm absolutely horrible at describing, you know, the smells so when people ask i'm like it smells good i don't know <laughs> and, uh, that's not my forte i i'm more of a visual you know oh it looks like this you know it's similar to this in the looks department blah 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 
you know, other than, you know, it smells great or whatever, whatever. It, I'm not the dude for, for the sniffer. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but so, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, when you lost it, was it something you kept looking for? Like when you, when you oh, were picking up clones? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I, it was one of the things that, you know, uh, family and friends, you know, all had it. And then, you know, I lost it and I went looking and nobody had it. it everybody lost it. You know, that's so. how it goes. <laughs> yep. yep. Yeah. But uh, so people are asking if it purpled. No, nah, no, uh -uh. no, uh -uh. not, not the one I got from my dad. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't really recall it even remotely having any type of purple to it at all. Yeah. yeah. And, and these, these, you know, NL five seeds that, you know, uh, I just ran, there was very, very little, if any, you know, actual purple to any of them. So, yeah. you know, um, but then again, uh, sometimes when you're making seed, uh, you know, the purple traits kind of, kind of tend to take a back seat. Yeah. Like a lot of, a lot of purple things will be halfway green, you know, or all the way green, you know, uh, when they're making seeds. So, I mean, uh, Mendo purple does that, you know, where it's, you know, more green than purple even under cool temperatures and everything when it's full of seeds yeah you know so um but uh, well, i think the plants have different uh processes when they're <laughs> pregnated versus not right right you know very, very um, they, they they do they do very different things their their goal is different at the time and and i didn't even think about this but i'm i'm feeding seeded out plants you know nitrogen fuck you know, all the way through yeah. yeah i'm not trying to cut off their nitro source you know early like it would a flower so yeah the goal is is healthy mature seeds not attractive flower mm -hmm. exactly the flower is just the carrier for the seed so yep. it's very yep. different it's a very different feeding regimen mm -hmm. uh to get where you want to go yeah and which, flower which is why when you have a failed run and a bunch of flour and no seed <laughs> smoke ain't the best yeah no. right <laughs> and, you know, said it. maybe maybe i should mention something is that uh C, you know csi has actual you know he has some pictures of some of these old gardens and stuff like that um mm -hmm. but unfortunately since it was all prohibition-y back then um they were on polaroids and uh you learn with polaroids that they fade over time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know yep. so uh they become the the colors start to become washed out the edges start to become less distinct yep. uh so you know, he cataloged some of it and, uh, you know, you can, you can get a general idea, but it's not the sharpest of picks. Right. I, I, I have thousands of these Polaroids, you know, for, you know, the better part of a decade. And now, now they're, uh, <laughs> yeah, not much to look at. Yeah. That's a bummer, dude. That's such a bummer. Right. Right. It's but... just something you didn't know at the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who knew yeah. that over 15 20 25 years polaroids would would fade right a, re a regular picture developed at a you know you know old school style will stay good for a long time right yeah. polaroids yeah. don't you know i so, should have scanned them all while i had the chance yeah i mean you know we all should have done things differently when we were younger uh yeah. you know that's the common theme right right your camera's slowly but surely burning out, bro. <laughs> well, you know, so the best thing is, is I was having, I was having a conversation with, with uh, our buddy Pip, uh, who is going to drop some seeds soon, and he might come on here and chat with Matt and I, but he didn't really want to show his face, so I'm definitely going to show him this CSI tech <laughs> yeah, right here. For real. Uh, <laughs> because it's exactly what he's looking for. Right. Uh, a disembodied <laughs> voice coming out of, coming out of the darkness. Isn't that how they always used to do? It yeah, is. Right? This is very 60 minutes in the 90s, you know? Right. I just need, <laughs> now I just need the voice tech. You yeah, know? you need that voice tech. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, right. Tell us what you saw, man. Tell, tell us what you saw in that room. Okay, so the, the, the seeds that Riot and I have available um, are basically an open pollination uh, from 47 plants, 27 females, 20 males, just open pollinated. And, uh, you know, there was 
there was definitely good, bad, and the ugly in there. Um, there was one plant that was near identical to the Northern Light I grew, you know, from 94 on from my dad. Um, smelled like it, looked extremely similar to it, you know, all of that. Um, and, you know, I, I had uh, one of my good old old buddies from, you know, from that area, you know, uh, you know, check, checking things out with me as it was progressing. And he was like, yeah, that's, that's just like the plant we, we used to rock, you know, 25 years ago. So that's wild. That That's definitely a good sign. Um, there was a lot of variety in there. Um, one of my favorites, of course, uh, was this one that was super frosty, kind of a popcorn nugget thing, uh, really good stretch. Um, and it was kind of bubble gummy. I, that's how I, you know, describe it, but I don't know, maybe other people would, you know, just describe the smell different. Um, but it was really nice. Um, and we're definitely saving that one. And then there was one that was, um, I just have it written down as stinky as fuck, but (laughs) it, it, it's, it, it had like 10 different smells, you know, top, middle, bottom. And I, I can't describe that kind of stuff, but you know, there's, there's guys with noses who are like, Oh yeah, that's blah, 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 you know, and list 20 different smells on something. But all I know is it smelled amazing too. Um, yeah. And that one, uh, that one's definitely a keeper. And then there were some other ones that, you know, ranged, uh, you know, this way and that way. And, you know, might, might end up being keepers, might not definitely going to give them a couple few runs to decide on which ones are going to kind of make the cut for future projects, you know? So yeah. that yeah. that's what I'm stoked about is that we get to see them as clones, not just yeah. seed, seed moms, you know, but as clones and they right. get clones of every single, it, it's, it's pretty ex- expansive. And it was a, it, it was a cool, it was cool that, and I know, you know, he, he, he credits me with getting the seeds and stuff, but it was, it was really cool to be able to, to look inside uh, CSI's mindset as he did these selections, what he was looking for, how he went about it, how many clones he was keeping of each. I learned a lot. I learned a lot from dude during this. So um, he put in the work. <laughs> no matter what he says, he put in the fucking work on this stuff. So, right. Uh, and yeah. maybe, and maybe I should add something in where Caleb and I chat a bunch about like, you know, phenos he's found in seed lines before. Um, that didn't survive, like, you know, the the backup clone didn't survive and he lost it. And he's like, well, you know, I got X amount of these seeds. I can find it again. So uh, maybe, you know, how excited were you, dude, to find something that was pretty close to the spitting image of your lost plant? I I was stoked on it. Um, But, you know, uh, I was honestly more excited with some of these other ones that, you know, because, you know, back in 94, you're, the the reality is, you know, um, it's just a, a traded clone. You have no idea, you know, where it came from, how many seeds it got selected from, you know, anything about it, you know. And that's the thing with traded clones is, you know, it might be selected from one or four or ten or a hundred, you know. Yeah. Um, I just like, you know, having the opportunity to actually select from better than one. Yeah, for sure. I think too that like there are things for all of us now that we're all, we're all older where mm. some of the strains that you grow first and you build your first relationships with as a grower right. stick in your mind because you're oh. learning so much then mm-hmm. and this is your kind bud plant right right you know and they really stick with you those and you know you think back like oh what could I have done uh, with that plant when I actually had some some knowledge Mm-hmm. When I had that plant, I was an idiot, you know, I was 19 or something and I didn't know Jack. And now I'm like, you know, what could I do if I had it now? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 You know, so. I'm, I'm a little interested too. And I know this is an NL talk, but are, are you, do you want to talk about any of the pinks and perp stuff you're seeing too, since that's a big project you have going on right now? <laughs> oh, we, we could touch on it just a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, um, had me amped. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely going to uh uh you know try to post up a little bit more on that soon. Uh, j- just because uh there's there's some interesting stuff in in there. Um and uh 
yeah, that one keeper I was telling you about, uh, it smells better than 99% of weed I've come across. So that's uh, wild, you know, um, definitely. It's not a purple pheno, pure green, you know, no wow. purple traits to it whatsoever. But man, the smell is just so overpowering. Uh, I, I think it could be a, a pass around with keeper as long as it's over 5% THC, of course. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> 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 well, you know, we, sh we should mention that some of the terpiest things tend mm -hmm. to be lower THC. Right, right. There's a right. ratio. There's a there's a there's a ratio there that's not fully understood. But right. a lot of times things that are extremely human perception terpy mm -hmm. don't tend to be the most potent. There are things out there that have both, but uh, a lot of them don't. So we'll right. see. And, and uh, ha have I told you mu much or anything about this? Uh, this pinks and purps plant. Uh, uh, I I heard it through your conversation. You and Matt chatted about it, and he called me all excited. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Because it's rare that you sound that excited. Yeah, about something that you found. I've, so he was. I've never hear him overstate anything about anything. Dude pops <laughs> thousands of seeds. So when he tells me, dude, <laughs> like this is special. Like I'm yeah, I, I mean, I think I think homie told me something like he he thinks it might be like the best pheno he's found. It, yeah, which for it, some, for someone like you to say who pops literally like thousands of seeds over a number of years and searches through them, that's right. really something. Oh yeah, you know, and it really uh, is. I, I like to give to give credit to you know uh, what what plants you know kind of produce these kind of things. Yeah, and uh, uh, this particular plant, you know, it has Mendo purple in its background, but there's no purple traits to this plant at all. But Mendo Purple has this strong uh, mango um, trait that pops yeah. up in the ones. And this thing is that mango times 100, you know. It's, it's just the strongest mango I've ever smelled. Wow. You know, uh, as, you know, and a bunch more fruit, too. But, uh, you know, I, I know it gets that mango, you know, at least, you know, a portion of it from, from the Mendo Purps. So, you know. Could be, cool, could be cool as long as i don't lose the clone <laughs> ganja boners yeah i mean one one of the things that the mendo p certainly has is it's got pretty wide genetic diversity so there's a lot of terps in there right you right. know and so then you throw it on something else that's also terpy and maybe wide and you can get these unusual things that have a p potential to pop up right i mean that's kind of like people should know this too and maybe i should say it right now where it's like if you cross something to like that, uh, you know, to, to, I don't know, to deep chunk, you're going to get a lot of deep chunk oh, right? yeah. and it's, and it's going to be really consistent, you know, and there's certain things you, you throw certain things on cookies and it looks very cookie. Right? Right, right. And so people get frustrated when you cross two very wide things because you can get a bunch of junk and you can get a bunch of this and that, and it's all like unpredictable. Oh, yeah. Oh, but yeah. then every once in a while, amongst all that stuff, there's this gem because it's so wide and unpredictable. And you're like, oh, whoa, what is that thing? Right, right. So sometimes the frustration and the effort pays off because it, a really wide base of things to look through. And maybe I should say this, too, is when, you know, when Caleb was referencing when he did the open pollination, that there was some gems, some mids, some junk that's 90s weed if you have a wide genetic base you're gonna get amazing mid z junk right. all in combo and yeah. also uh on that pinks and perps one uh you know i i always i was i always forget this but um i i grew out when when i i made those and found that one i, w I was growing out 180 of those things so there was only one like it out of 180 yeah you know so i wonder how it's gonna breed because it was such a outlier right uh, yeah. were, were there other other phenos that were more consistent and like popping up more often oh yeah the the the, the purple ones were predominant yeah you know? to find an actual green one in in this hybrid was actually the rarity you know most most everything was you know some form of light pink or lavender you know all the way through you know purple to almost black yeah you know but uh yeah the the green ones were were rare 
you know, and, and I, I probably kept out of the 180, I probably kept about 20 or so of the, of the darker purple ones and just the real terpier ones, the, you know, but they're all, I don't think I, I have any other uh, green ones out of the whole, all, all the purples and the blacks. That's so, wild, man. Yeah. That it was so consistently that, and then this one pops up. Right. So, and so yeah. maybe I should throw this out there just real quick before we totally lose the thread on it is on some of these ones that you found that, that the one that's super frosty and smells to you like bubble gum and the one that kind of reminds you strongly of your dad, dad's, dad's NL and such, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. you're probably planning on doing some more breeding with those select females, correct? Oh yeah. I'm already working on that too. Uh, so the the first round, of course, was the open pollination. And now um, I have a, a room that's a couple few weeks into flower. And that's all the keeper females. And my keeper male, my favorite male out of the whole bunch, which is, um, I don't know, it's, it's like almost a milk chocolatey smelling male. And he's super pungent. And he almost looks like a bigger uh, version of purple indica you know yeah, that's that cool. was that's a throwback from the same you know washington areas these seeds came from you know so you know there's there's something to that and uh like i've told uh um told matt i'm not sure if i i told you not so but uh um when the the norm lights i used to have um you know occasionally i'd throw a, a late nana or whatever whatever and i grew out a bunch of s1 seeds well I gave, you know, some of these S1s to my buddy, you know, uh, clones of the S1s anyway. And uh, um, he uh, accidentally crossed it to train wreck. <laughs> and when that stuff was grown out, it had that same chocolatiness that I'm smelling in this thing, you know, when grown outdoors. So I don't know if it's just coincidence or or what, but, you know. It, it it could just be same same similar genetics. The power yeah. of accidents. Mm -hmm. The power yeah. of accidents. So maybe I should throw this in there too. So if with with the these seeds that uh, Matt and Caleb are offering up this open pollination, uh, what that's going to give you is you know that's going to give you your own ability to hunt through the line, and it's going to be very wide. You know, mm -hmm. but you could find gems just like he found, you yeah, know, right. uh, you could you could absolutely perhaps find what you wouldn't know that, look, you know, there, there could be bubblegum smelling ones. There could be this ones. There could be there's a reasonably good chance that somewhere in there it, those phenos pop up again and yep. then give them X amount of months to do some more breeding. And we'll get a chance to see if some of these selected females breed true for the traits that he liked. Mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. those will be on offer too so that's kind of like which for people that don't know that's kind of like when you get old seeds or seeds that you want to preserve one of the best things to do to keep the genetic diversity of the line is just to open pollinate everything right and mm -hmm. then you know you can set aside you know some seeds from selected phenos and you can keep certain phenos and start breeding with them and intentionally and seeing where it takes you so that's kind of like the, that's one of the processes of um, taking old seeds and trying to both preserve the line, but then take it in certain directions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, yep. That's, I, always I mean, that's kind of how I, and you've done that a number of times with like various heirloom strains that you've come across, you know? Always open pollinate, step one, and then, you know, you can do whatever you want past that, you know, directional this way, that way, or the other, you know? And everybody else can too, as long as you know you share the seed and all that, you know. Yeah. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm Are there any other projects you're you're super stoked about past that? Like uh, any fem projects coming up that you're 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 pumped about? Ooh, I got that patient zero coming. <laughs> patient zero is on its way. Uh, I don't know that that one's gonna be interesting. Um, I'm not sure how that one's gonna turn out, but you know, we'll see. It could be cool. Maybe you could explain for people because you have so many names because uh, you're so prolific about things. What is Patient Zero? Oh, Patient Zero is a, you know, a, 
Um, basically, it's the just the Urkel across the Pakistani Chitral Kush. And I grew out a uh, hundred and something of those years ago. And my absolute favorite plant of, uh, of that one was a was was the one I named Patient Zero. Um, and you know, it's it's kind of as long as you like a little terpenaline in your diet, it's pretty all right. <laughs> <laughs> and so maybe I'll add that to it too, where it's like mo a lot of modern breeding today is one-offs where people mm -hmm. hybridize something and then just toss it out to the public. Right. Um, what he just described is what's known as like multi-stage breeding, mm -hmm. where he made a cross, he grew out a bunch of phenos, he picked one that he liked, and now he's doing further work with that pheno itself. Mm -hmm. Probably crossing it to itself and crossing it to other uh, cuttings that he has in the stable that he thinks might blend well with it. Right. Um, what, one of my favorites I actually have uh, flowering right now um, is uh, uh, the Mendo Purple number 54 selection from, you know, growing out that last hundred and something of those. Mm -hmm. and the Urkel 103, you know, S1. And then, you know, those, you know, um, I reversed the 103, slapped it on the Mendo. Man, those are uniform. I mean, as uniform as you can get, really. Yeah, but that's cool. Interestingly, uh, the Mendo is extremely dominant on it. Uh, really? Yeah, they're all, they look more like Mendo purple plants than you can barely see any Urkel to them. And the, both of those selections were made out of that room that I came and visited you and saw before you, uh, the S1s of Urkel and the S1s of Mendo P? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, yeah. Um, definitely interesting though. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I was excited too, like about, I don't know if you want to talk about any of the purple punch stuff or if that's, you know what I mean? Like the the findings in that, that you're kind of seeing that are unique? Yeah, yeah. Um, the we, we, We've talked and the most surprising thing about breeding with purple punch is how fucking stable it is. I mean, Actually, right. we, we, when you're working with, you know, it, it doesn't matter what, you know, OGs, diesels, chem dogs, Girl Scouts, you know, and then all the popular stuff based off all those, yeah. you're going to find a nice portion of, you know, uh, hermaphrodism, you know, more so if, you know, <laughs> your your environment's not, you know, perfect. But, you know, even if you have a perfect environment, there's always going to be a percentage of those. Um, yeah. But the purple punches have almost the lowest uh, levels of hermaphrodism I've seen in any hybrids. So, eh, that's, I mean, that's, that's useful. That's something people look for. And I think like the right. fact that it popped up in an OG GDP was kind of shocking, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I, I was, I was the, I wasn't a huge fan of purple punch. I didn't even, you know, start growing it until a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of ignored it and was like, I got plenty of my own Urkel hybrids. I don't need another one. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it has traits that it put, puts forward and you really can't argue with it you know yeah that was the same way you know we both just kind of dodged hype for a while with like the fucking the, <laughs> the, the the gorilla glue and that and then end up at the end we're like fuck that shit's kind of good man right <laughs> last one to the party that's an interesting that's an interesting aspect that people maybe should hear about is sometimes you can have an amazing cut that checks a bunch of boxes mm -hmm. and it breeds like shit Right. It's right. all over the place. It throws a bunch of junk and it yep. does, the, the quality inherent in the cut itself doesn't seem to translate to its children very well. Mm -hmm. And then other times you can take something like purple punch that they're just talking about that has a lot of nice traits, but kind of lacks high or whatever else. And you don't think that much right. of it. And then you cross it to things and its children come out incredibly amazing with a bunch of traits that you like. Right. So right. sometimes yeah. a breeding parent, can actually be kind of a crappy crappy plant in some ways like right. uh caleb likes a lot of the s1s of my mendo p quite a bit more than the mama mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh yeah you know the mama is amazing for breeding but as an actual plant itself there's some aspects to it that are unpredictable and and it's low thc 
Right, right. Um, but some of its children and some of the things that it throws and when you breed, um, and sometimes you might take something like Purple Punch that people make fun of and you breed with it and you're like, wow, this thing is amazing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It throws all these traits consistently that are useful. Right. I mean, like, you could talk for a minute about how stable that bubblegum cut you have is mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. why you use it in so many different things because it throws, like, rot. You know, it, it, it doesn't rot very easily. It, it's got incredible structure. It, it densens things up, right? Right, right. Well, I don't know about – it's really not the densest cut out there, but it's, it's, uh, it's definitely uh, – um, you know, as, as rot resistant as you can, you can get a plant, you know, um, on, on my worst year, year ever outdoors, I think I was aiming for like 700 pounds or something. And then we had six inches of rain the last week of September, <laughs> you know, first week of October. And I lost 50 to 60% of that garden to mold. And the only thing that came through that garden with probably less than 1% rot ratio was that bubblegum cut. That's and, winning. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, so, you know, tons of people are like, you know, what's your best, you know, mold resistant, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, <laughs> right there, you know. So. That outdoor queen. Yeah. So, yep. so some of, sometimes those traits, like they were just talking about, like, you know, uh, Caleb does an enormous amount of breeding. So for him to say that the purple punch is some of the most non-intersex stable thing he's ever worked with is saying something, right. you know, when he says that like this plant is almost immune to mold and it's the most mold resistant plant I've ever seen. And it passes that trait to some progeny. That's useful information. Right. Yeah. right. You know? I, I see a lot of people commenting on the purple punch strength and like, when breeding has changed um, from where it was maybe 10 years ago on what we would select for potency wise, what we wouldn't use, what we would use certain one of us, you know, um, purple punch, all I'd ever heard about was how weak it was. So I just never, I never got into it. However, it is a, is a very extract centric community now. And with extracts, pretty much everything's fucking strong. Um, so, so a lot of things are, are more terp based now where people are, are checking out what kind of terps are being passed, how they breed. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it, some people won't want to, won't want to fuck with anything that doesn't lay them out. Me, I, I like all kinds of ranges of different highs and I don't like being laid out. So for mm -hmm. me, purple punch is fucking perfect. Oh I, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, weed, weed affects humans in different ways. Um, mm -hmm. Some of my favorite strains to smoke on a regular basis. The other two guys that were, ch you know, they don't like it that much on a. They they agree it's it's a super quality cut, but it's mm -hmm. not something with their body chemistry that really adapts all that well. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I have friends that only like incredibly potent indicas because they want to be hammered down, mm -hmm. and a sativa makes them crawl up the wall. Yeah, right. I have other friends that smoke a sativa and they relax. Right. That would be so, me. <laughs> so yeah, so can cannabis, cannabis and individual strains uh, don't think that the way it affects you is the way it affects everyone. Mm -hmm. there, there's a range there. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's why I like keeping so many different, you know, cultivars because, you know, I, I, I like a whole spectrum of different things. And I know other people too, you know, like different things. So you can't always breed for yourself. You know? Definitely not. <laughs> Does the, does the purple punch reverse? Uh, yeah, yeah, it reverses fine. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. So it reverses easily, but won't ever throw intersex traits. Yeah, yeah. That's well, kind of odd in itself. Right? The, the yeah. S1 that I got growing now, I don't think I found a single ball or, or, or nanner on any of them. Yeah. Which is almost unheard of. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you, you're usually going to get at least 10 to 20%, you know, and I, I say 10 to 20% and that could just be one ball down low or one, you know, a, a late Nana or something, but there's always going to be like 10 to 20%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then but. there's certain things that, um, perm, but mm -hmm. won't reverse. Right. Right. You know, I mean, we've talked before about, we're not going to get into it too much, but 
you know, they, uh, you know, the old sour cuts are famous for not reversing. Oh, yeah. Uh, or getting a handful of seed. But they're also famous for the wrong conditions and they, they throw nanners that can see, uh, create seed in your room for flower production. Yeah, and it's I, really easy to grow it boofy. <laughs> I had a, I had some sour, some sour D's in a, in a fully seeded out room just recently. And, uh, um, you know, completely full of seed. And about week four, it just starts balling up, just hanging all kinds of <laughs> sour diesel balls, even <laughs> though it's fully seeded. So there, the whole room was completely seeded. So it didn't have any risk of pollinating anything. But, you know, it still felt the need to, you know, throw out just a ton of balls. Like, what are you doing with those? You know, what? <laughs> I didn't see any pollen off of them, but, you know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, um, the, the, what I consider to be the original, but, you know, it's the one I got. The Chem D cut uh, is pretty famous for throwing a bunch of nanners at week three, four, uh, but they're sterile. You know, they don't really, they don't really, uh, you know, uh, right. they don't, they don't really make seed. Yeah. And that Chem D or just Chem Ds in general, it seems. Yeah. They, they throw bananas like they're going out of style. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a trait that goes there. And so I've had any number of friends or helpers or whatever on a light depth greenhouse come to me panicked because mm -hmm. half the greenhouse has bananas popping out all over. Right. And I'm like, oh, calm down, calm down. It's it's the D. We're going to be fine, you know, and we're fine. <laughs> you know, you right. don't even find a bean. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you do that with cherry pie or something and you have beans everywhere. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. certain things, certain things are, are different, have different risky, you know, there's different levels of risk. Yeah. 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 Very so, true. I mean, maybe we should, maybe we should chat about this. Maybe we should reel it back in for a second. <laughs> um, part of the reason why we did this NL five chat, uh, both starting in the eighties and going through some of the history and then bringing Caleb on was to talk about the project that, that him and Matt have going. And uh, they, they just dropped the seeds, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes, or we're about to, or just did. No, no, they're dropped. Uh, they're dropped. Caleb's Caleb's site is humblecsi.com. Correct, Caleb? Yeah. There, you can buy them on there or on riotseedco.com. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so it's a it's a it's a riot and uh, and Caleb collab, um, and it's a big open pollination of genetics from um, one of the people that was intimately involved in the old NL crew. Uh, so the, the provenance is excellent as far as like who it comes from. Um, and, you know, but then on, on top of that too, the proof is in the pudding. So, you know, um, it, uh, it's a chance for people to maybe hunt around if you have, if you're a little adventurous and look through something old and something famous, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, you know, Caleb found a few things in it that he was super excited about. And so hopefully you, you, you guys will too. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the ways that we're going to make sure that not everything is Skittles, OG, Cookie, Cushmints, whatever, is by people taking effort and reviving some of these old things and making fresh bats of, batches of seed that are more viable and then getting them into people's hands so the gene pool stays wider. Yeah, yeah. So not only is it a cool old project to something that's extremely famous, uh, and there's potential in it. Um, but you can better believe that most modern breeding, uh, with a few exceptions, is the same 30 or 40 cuts blended in a bunch of different ways over the last 10 years. And this harkens back to a much older time. So there's a possibility there that when you outcross things to something that aren't like each other, if you take these NL5s and you start throwing it on different stuff you have, you might get some unusual stuff you're not expecting that's good. Right. You know, Brent's fucking with me. Sorry, guys. No, it's like, because that's because that's the thing is a, a lot of breeders say that, like, sometimes, you know, crossing two very distinct things together is where you really get quality to pop. Yeah. You know, and you're certainly introducing something older in the gene pool that was very common 20, 30 years ago, but now is many generations interbred. And so uh, by these guys doing this project where it's kind of getting thrown out there again, where it can get bred into a lot of modern stuff 
and people get to see what happens. So, you know, you'll, you'll get more opportunities to see what CSI is doing with the work uh, in future breeding projects that seem like they're already engaged. Um, and hopefully people are going to buy a bunch of this stuff and start posting and trying them out themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. one of the ways you can keep cannabis history alive. Right. And making the birds with the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, mixing it with modern things and seeing what happens. Right. Right. So what do, what do you guys think would be the best, you know, available, uh, plant line, whatever out there to cross to the NL fives, you know, I, I, I personally, I want to see the hogs breath NL five. I think that would be cool if, if uh, we could track that down and do that again. It's been out of my hands for a while, but I think that would be interesting just because of the terms. Mm -hmm. How about you, not so? You know, I actually think that um, it might cross well with something like the dog shit. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. You know? Kind of, kind of a potentially almost a back cross? Potentially almost. I mean, a, ba a back cross has to use the, the technically the same cut to go back to, but right. maybe something that is very NL, uh, mm -hmm. because one thing I'll say about that dog shit grown indoor is boy, does it look like nineties weed, mm -hmm. yeah. like lime green with bright orange hairs. And it just has that like NL type of like, like look, uh, I was going to say hydro, but, uh, Caleb is purely organic. So I don't want to insult him, but just that, like <laughs> that, like big sack of hydro NL that you would get, you know, that's just super frosty and stuff like that. And so, um, you know, but it might give it some stretch and some vigor and it might kind of like, and that's kind of like what I like. One of the things that I get interested about is crossing two different things that you think have similar parentage behind them. Mm -hmm. yes. And then you see if you get some throwbacks mm. because both parents have it. Yeah. I, I do have the dog shit in uh, my, my latest round. Uh, so, you know, but it, it, it's getting crossed to that that chocolatey um, mm -hmm. NL5 male. And honestly, uh, I think there were better, uh, there were males that kind of looked more similar to dog shit. But uh, um, I, you know, I, I didn't use them personally for this round um, because I liked that, you know, particular, you know, chocolatey one. And if I was going to throw out one more recommendation and combine mm -hmm. the old with the new, Right. Um, one of Neville's most classic combinations was uh, NL5 and Skunk. And yeah. I kind of view uh, the Diesel family as sur what we have is surviving modern Skunk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not that there's not cheese and a couple other things like that, but I kind of view like Sours as American Skunk. Right. Or very, very skunkish. So it would be kind of cool to see like what we have now is skunk and what we have now is NL blended back together. Right. Um, because that was one of the most classic best selling and it, they combined super well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, hmm. Yeah. Um, I definitely have cheese in there too. So, you know, you know, the, yeah. at least skunk one, are you talking skunk one or skunk? <laughs> I mean, I, that's, I, Cheese is fine. That's obviously pure skunk one. That's really old. I was just thinking of certain diesels, just because I consider yeah, I yeah. consider oh. certain diesels uh, modern. That to me, that even though it doesn't have the name, I consider uh -huh. a diesel to be like a skunk skunk skunkoid type plant. Right, right. It's right. tall. It's rangy. You know, it's it's got that kind of skunk type growth to it. It's got these very. I, I basically think of like gas and diesel as it's not like roadkill, but it is on that skunk spectrum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's like different angles of the same terps. Yeah. You know, yeah. is kind of how I see it. So, you know, um, but yeah. And then the other thing too, is that, you know, he, you know, you cross it to things you hope are going to cross well, and then you cross it to some things that are just random. And sometimes those random ones end up being, the best ones because you really don't know and you really don't know what genes are going to pop. Right, right, right. And you really don't know what recessives are in there. True, true. Right? Like, so to take it back to humans, unless both parents have the gene, you can't have kids with blue eyes or green eyes. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, you if if one parent has the recessive, the other parent has the dominant, it won't combine. Right. Uh, blonde hair is the same way. Both parents have to have the blonde hair gene or the red hair gene or it won't mm -hmm. pop. And so sometimes if you take two things that you think might have similar genes, you might get some recessives that pop and all of a sudden something unusual comes out, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I promise to to not hold Caleb too long. I know he's, he's got some shit to do tonight too. So I, I, I'm thankful for you coming and talking about the Northern Lights. I know everybody's super stoked to be able to hear about it firsthand. Um, but yeah, is there anything else you want to talk about before we all bounce? Oh, I, I think I'm good. I got to go wrangle a five-year-old beast. The beast! <laughs> yeah. Well, we know, yeah. We know uh, Friday night isn't the easiest night for you, so we super appreciate you coming on and sh shooting the shit and yeah. all that, you know? And, uh, you know, I briefly saw your face in the shadows there for a minute before the pitch <laughs> black kicked in. Um, but yeah, you know. Um, that's that's kind of it. We wanted to chat about NL. We wanted to chat about the history. We wanted to clear up some misconceptions. And yeah. we wanted people to hear about some of the specifics of what was available, how it was made, what you what we saw in it, um, and let people go from there. Oh, yeah. So as always, everyone, thank you for giving us part of your Friday night. You know, Caleb, uh, where do you where where do, where can people find your seats again? Uh, HumboldtCSI.com. There you go. Yeah. HumboldtCSI.com. Go grab the NL5, please. Hey. Go experience it. Make sure you let them know about yours, too. Uh, yeah, I got it, too. But, but you know, right. support the man. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, both, both, both guys have it. You can get them both off each of their individual websites. Um, they were communicating a bunch during the, during the grow. They were talking about what he was seeing, sharing pictures and just, you know, it, and all that. And so, um, you know, it's how a lot of, it's how a lot of passion projects get made today is with, uh, uh, people that have similar interests collaborating and making it work. So yeah. support it if you can, if you, you know, it'd be great. Uh, and it would spread out some old genetics and it would keep them alive and you could do your little part to make sure that the gene pool stays wider mm -hmm. and hopefully find some fire. Yeah. Yep. So, mm -hmm. you know, everybody enjoy their Friday night. Uh, as always, there's a million questions we didn't get to, um, but you can always hit us up on our Discord. Matt and We're I on chat Patreon. up there. We have the Breeders Patreon. Matt, Patreon. Yeah. Matt and I chat up there a whole bunch. We're pretty responsive to questions and all that. And so... You know, every every Friday night, we'll try to bring you something new and pertinent and interesting and bring on various friends we have uh, and all that and uh, kind of just push the history and the info forward. And at the very least, you'll get to see Not So Naked. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> thanks, Enjoy, Caleb. everyone. You have a great Talk night. Good night. Cheers.